an increasing number of couples are travelling abroad to seek infertility treatment. It's described as one of the fastest growing areas of medical tourism, although that's a word none of those undertaking this journey like to use. Is it costing too much in terms of emotional, physical and financial stress? 76% have either been or would go abroad for treatment. To date we've spent £90,000 on treatments. It's clear that we're playing Russian roulette in starting to have our families in our 30s. It should be the most natural thing in the world, starting your family when the time is right for you. But for thousands, it just doesn't happen. I'm BBC Scotland's health correspondent, Eleanor Bradford, and today I'm asking why many childless people choose to take the overseas route to pregnancy, all of them driven by a desperate desire to have a baby. There is speculation that paying donors would encourage more of them to come forward, and she points out that the recompense to donors in the UK is very meagre. In this country, you pay expenses and you can pay compensation to a maximum of £250. In Spain, it is about €900. Euros. But whether paying donors or not is important, the availability of donor eggs in particular is what infertile women are going abroad for, often time and time again, as with this patient, whose desperation for a child of her own has cost her very dear in every way. She wishes to protect her own anonymity. I've been trying to have a family for about six years now and so far we've had 17 treatments to date. We're due our 18th and probably final treatment this summer and it's been quite an experience in terms of emotional upset and <laughs> financial ruin, shall we say. To date we've spent £90,000 on treatments. We went to America first of all for treatment three years ago and I did conceive. But unfortunately I lost the baby after seven weeks and return home so that was horrendous and from that point we decided that we needed to use donor eggs and that's why we went abroad because obviously there's less waiting time and there's more choice in terms of what treatments you can have abroad and so we have been to Barcelona now and Alicante in total maybe four or five times for treatment. I feel that the medical protocols are more tailored to your individual needs. The donors tend to be younger, there is less waiting times, there is various packages, for want of a better word, that are in offer in that you can have a dedicated donor where you would pay more money, perhaps about £8,000, or in Barcelona, BCNICF for Dr Olivia Addis works, he offers the shared donor scheme where you can actually go and have a shared donor at one cycle, minimum of three embryos for £3,000, so it's much more affordable. It's frustrating and I guess the law that I'm done away with anonymity has been quite significant in that there are less people coming forward because obviously they don't want this um, child turning up on the doorstep 18 years later saying hi, you believe you're my biological mother or father. So you can understand from everyone's point of view how that might be difficult. That's not the case abroad. The donors remain anonymous. And it's certainly something that my husband and I have had to think about very deeply. You know, we know when we go abroad that we don't have any information about the donor. So we've had to think long and hard about that. The real story of heartbreak behind the facts and figures. Another concern is the incidence of multiple births after treatment at clinics overseas. In the UK, it's the norm to transfer just one embryo at a time although each case is decided separately, and for some women it may be too. Juliette Tizard of the HFEA. Some countries don't have the same kind of standards as we do around things like trying to minimise the rate of multiple births, for instance. And of course, if you go abroad for treatment, you have a large number of embryos put back, perhaps inappropriately. You obviously come back to the UK and have your antenatal and obstetric care here. And that's something that some hospitals have been raising with us, that they're seeing some people who've had treatment abroad coming home with twins and sometimes triplets. But Dr Olivares in Barcelona sees it differently. 
Nowadays, everybody is talking about a single embryo transfer, which is something that is very easy to talk about and very difficult to make as an acceptable choice for, for patients. But obviously, if you transfer fewer embryos, you may be facing the, the fact that the pregnancy rates are also going to be a bit lower, and the patients are going to be charged exactly the same amount of money. And the fact that, well, if I got twins, it's good because I don't want to go through the same process two years later. So if I got two for the price of one, it's going to be a good thing. Finding out where to go and what the various clinics offer is essential. There are hundreds of websites, adverts and other publicity material designed to attract those in need of their services. But how do you choose? Dr. Francoise Shenfield says many turn to the internet. We know from our studies that they get most of the information from websites and websites are not always accurate. And what is very important is, for instance, to check the success rate, which may be quoted on the website. In this country, it's very clear. The HFEA has set up some standards to report your success rate. And you're not always sure of what is put on any website unless it has been checked. Professor Lorraine Cully from De Montfort University in Leicester has just completed a study into the reasons why people do go abroad for treatment. And one of her findings, after in-depth interviews with people who'd done this, is that it helps to share facts and experiences. The people that we spoke to did a lot of research. They gathered information, not just from clinic websites. Of course, most of them had a healthy scepticism about clinic websites, but they talked to each other. So the internet forum is very, very important for people. They chatted about where were good places to go, good clinicians, even you know, where is a good place to stay day near the clinic and so on. So this kind of sharing of information with each other was very important. But I think many of them would have welcomed a stamp of approval or, or quality so they could be sure that the standards were equal to the UK. I mean, people were aware that, you know, the UK is a very highly regulated context and this isn't the case necessarily everywhere in the world. Europe is quite well regulated, but of course, if you're going further afield to places like India and indeed the, the USA, there's actually very little formal legal regulation. And that might mean finding out about all the available treatments, and particularly local regulations and whether levels of care are good enough. Juliet Tizard of HFEA. There are high levels and there is a European Union directive that's been enforced since 2007 and it focuses largely on the safety and kind of laboratory practice which is a big part of IVF and, and donor treatments. It sets a base standard for handling cells and sperm and eggs and embryos, for making sure that they're traceable if they're taken from one country to another, they're properly labelled. There are standards of the laboratory environment that all clinics within the EU have to abide by. Gwenda Burns of the Infertility Network counsels caution. Our advice would be not to rush into anything too quickly. It's really, really important that people do their homework, they research as much as they can, because even if they have spoke to someone who has maybe been to Spain, if you're going to a different country, the laws and regulations will be totally different. And it's also really important that you think about the support that is going to be around about you while you're taking this journey because a lot of countries don't offer counselling. It's so vitally important that you receive counselling beforehand so you understand exactly the pros and cons of what you're about to do. Dr Raul Olivares set up his own clinic in Barcelona after tiring of the production line atmosphere he was working in before. This kind of treatment have changed a lot. Initially, it was called uh, fertility tourism, and clinics tend to offer uh, seven days stays at the hotels with relax, and in some cases, they still offer that. We, we have changed the approach. We try to make things as easy as possible to patients. So as, as I've always tell my patients, if everything goes as we expect, we are only going to meet twice. The day of the first visit, we spend like one and a half, two hours talking about all the treatments. Everything else is done by email or by phone and on the day of the embryo transfer. So how sure can patients be that the eggs and sperm they receive are really healthy and disease-free? Dr Francoise Shenfield is confident that high standards do apply across Europe, especially as this week ESHRA published a code of conduct to ensure high standards. 
First of all, donors are screened, so you take a good family history and you can exclude a certain number of things. Furthermore, all the donors with a family history which put the offspring at risk would be excluded on these very grounds. So it is very unlikely. It's just as unlikely of having a sexually transmitted disease because in Europe the standards will be the same and all donors would be screened for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C and other viruses. And that should be quite safe from the physical point of view for the offspring. So where does the NHS stand in all this? In Scotland, individual health boards decide how many free cycles of IVF patients may be given, usually two and sometimes three. And there are long waiting lists for people needing donor eggs too. Is the NHS letting people down? Professor Lorraine Cully. It may well be considered to be letting many people who need fertility treatment down in the sense that many people would argue that there should be more public funding for for IVF. But of course, that's a controversial issue in terms of how one distributes scarce resources within healthcare system. I'm sure many people would argue that this is a real healthcare need and that, that people should have access to treatment. But I think for many of these people, certainly in, in the case of needing donor gametes, then Perhaps more could be done in the UK to try to improve the supply of gametes for people. And many of them then wouldn't actually need to go abroad. 